All right, welcome everyone to this, uh, this edition of the NIMH Director's Innovation Speaker Series. I am Joshua Gordon, Director of the National Institute of, my, of Mental Health, and it's my pleasure uh, to host this uh, talk, which will be given by Roberto Luis Fernandez, uh, and I'll, it, whom I will introduce in just a moment. Before I do so, let me remind everyone that there is an ACL interpreter, ASL interpreter, uh, and if you can't see her on your screen, find her video and pin it, uh, and that will help. There's also captioning available by the closed caption uh, uh, capabilities of Zoom, and you should be able to find that on the bottom of your screen. Finally, one more housekeeping note. You may ask questions for Dr. Luis Fernandez to answer at any point during the presentation by using the Q&A function and Alex Denker will moderate the Q&A at the end of the talk. All right, so without further ado, we'll get started. Again, it's really my pleasure to have Dr. Roberto Luis Fernandez here. Uh, Roberto is um, really an outstanding scientist, a wonderful clinician, and I know from personal experience, a fantastic teacher. He's professor, professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons and the director of the New York State Center of Excellence for Cultural Competence and the Hispanic Treatment Program, as well as being the co-director of the Anxiety Disorders Clinic. Uh, all of these things taking place at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, which is, uh, as many of you may, may know, um, uh, a, a, a joint uh, effort with the, between New York State and the uh, Columbia University. Uh, Roberto also taught teaches, I assume, but certainly taught uh, cultural psychiatry and cultural competence to psychiatry residents. And that's where I first got to know him as a resident uh, at Columbia. Dr. Luis Fernandez's research focuses on developing culturally valid clinical interventions and novel service delivery approaches to help overcome disparities in the care of underserved cultural groups. His work centers on improving treatment engagement and retention in mental health and physical health care by persons with a variety of mental illnesses. He also studies the way cultural culture affects individuals' experiences of mental disorders and their help-seeking expectations, including how to explore this cultural variation using the psychiatric evaluation. In fact, he led the development of the DSM-5 cultural formulation interview a standardized method for cultural assessment for use in mental health practice, and was the principal investigator of its international field trial in multiple countries. Roberto, welcome. So glad you're here with us today, and I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, uh, Josh. Uh, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button here on my timer. <laughs> there it is. You sure, uh, you sure brought me back there with the memory of uh, uh, me being your teacher in uh, residency. I, am, I want to appreciate uh, very much NIMH including uh, ethno-racial disparities in its director's innovation series and asking you to present. There's a lot of exciting work in this area that I'm happy to share with you. And uh, first I wanna thank Michaela Rodriguez and Dali John, my, uh, who are colleagues of mine at the Cultural Competence Center at, at PI at New State Psychiatric Institute, who helped uh, put this talk together along with other colleagues. So one of the takeaways, there's two that I want to share with you. I hope you, it comes across in the talk is that causes of and dis, uh, pathways of ethno-racial disparities in mental health are quite complex and that we need multi-level studies and strategies to address disparities in the risk of mental disorders, access to and use, access to and use quality and outcomes of mental health care. The timeliness of the topic, ethno-racial disparities in mental health is very uh, good because of the growing awareness of structural racism and ethnic discrimination that has been manifested in episodes of police violence and in disparities related to the COVID infection and death and ethno-racial disparities in that. And you see here, some of those uh, terrible statistics about age-adjusted COVID-19 deaths showing, showing the ethno-racial disparities in the country 
as of August of 2020 in COVID related deaths. So um, one would expect from this also a differential rate of uh, mental health consequence. We'll come to that in a minute. First, this is the outline of the talk. The conceptual basis of disparities will be covered first, following by promising topics for research on disparities in mental health risk, assessment, service access and delivery. These topics I feel are very important for NIMH because the social conditions that lead to disparities affect all aspects of mental health, including neurobiology. They are often poorly measured and if unaddressed will continue to interfere with mental health care. First, a definition of disparities. This is taken from paraphrasing several existing definitions Health disparities are preventable and unjust differences in health status, outcomes, and burden of disease that adversely affect socially disadvantaged populations. Ethno-racial disparities are only one of many kinds of disparities. I will not address those disparities directly in the talk, but many of the points I raise, I hope will apply. This slide is here as one of the many schematics on the causes and pathways of health and mental health disparities. The main point of the slide is you will, if you will, it's just how complicated it is. I will not go through the slide of the, the, the many causes on this graphic. Uh, I just wanted to show it to you to tell you how many levels and elements and components there are of causes and pathways of disparities. These are not, these causes and pathways are not only uh, present at the individual level, but they're also at systemic or institutional levels and at larger societal and structural levels as well. And we need to include all of these levels in our models of disparities if we are to understand them. We also need to address all these levels in the interventions we design and implement, but too often our, our research is focused only on individual level variables. I will now turn to very briefly uh, noting some ethno-racial disparities in mental health and the mental health care continuum. I will use the term BIPOC in the talk to denote black, indigenous, and people of color individuals. Despite a higher exposure to social adversity and discrimination than non-Latino white Americans, BIPOC individuals tend not to have higher prevalence of psychopathology. So it's important also to focus on resilience factors as we go along, not just uh, problems that cause uh, worsenings in you know, disparities, but also factors that protect different populations. In addition to the BIPOC groups, most of them not having higher indices on many disorders, psychopathology prevalence varies substantially both across and within ethno-racial minoritized groups. What BIPOC groups do generally tend to have are more persistent, severe, and impairing mental and emotional disorders. And one major contribution to this is the consistently worse indices of mental health care they receive across the full continuum of service access and delivery, as noted in the graphic. You see there the various examples of disparities in access and quality of care in the different boxes that are listed, that are present here along this loop of care. And in the loop is there to denote how this worse uh, access and services of care and outcomes are uh, have an impact on the uh, severity, impairment, and persistence of psychopathology, which is one of the main reasons uh, uh, people tend to agree is uh, that the, uh, despite not having higher prevalence, the disorders are, are worse in these uh, characteristics. Now, it's still somewhat unclear why uh, BIPOC groups, many BIPOC groups do not have higher prevalence of psychopathology. And this is illustrated here. It's considered a paradox. And it, it's, con it's uh, included here, it's seen here in the prevalence of meeting a cutoff score in symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorders on the leftmost graph, or of trauma and stressor related disorders in the rightmost graph in the spring of 2020. The one on trauma and stressor disorders are symptoms related to COVID-19 related trauma and stressor disorders. 
despite BIPOC individuals having higher death rates from COVID, as I showed you earlier, as much as 3.5 times higher than Black Americans, for example. This CDC data shows only small elevations of these cutoff scores in Black individuals compared to whites and lower uh, rates of uh, cutoff scores in Asian Americans, especially for anxiety or depressive symptoms. Latino, uh, Latinx Americans have uh, 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 in, this, uh, pretty, in this sample, somewhat higher scores as it's commensurate with their higher death rates. Why this variation in symptom reports? There are many explanations, some of which have to do with artifacts of measurement or sampling, which I won't address in the talk, but I will focus instead on some other multi-level processes that contribute to these findings and that we need to understand in order to address disparities. So now I'm gonna to turn to contributions to disparities in risk of mental disorders. And it, this part of the presentation has three sections, intersectionality, subjective appraisal, and societal structure. I will take each one in turn. First, intersectionality. This is a major contributor to the complexity of the evidence on risk in ethno-racial disparities. The, uh, Intersectionality can be defined briefly as the simultaneous impact of multiple aspects of identity or of social position. And these different aspects of identity are associated with different social statuses, adverse exposures, and access to resources. The, and the relationship between these multiple aspects is not additive, it's not simple, it's multiplicative, complex. They yield emergent effects from different combinations of social statuses and identities. And intersectionality compounds and modifies the uh, effect of risk and protective factors. I'll provide you with an illustration uh, here in this graph, classic graph of an intersection, of an interaction. This examines this uh, study examines the impact of subjective social status, uh, the study done by Liu and colleagues, subjective, subjective social status, where the, meaning where the person thinks they fall in the social hierarchy, the contribution of this status to probability of mood or anxiety disorder here on the y-axis in two groups of Asian immigrants. One who migrated at, uh, at, uh, at, at an earlier age between uh, lower than age 25 and another set, another group that migrated at age 25 or older. In the graph, we see that subjective social status only impacts probability of mental disorders for Asian Americans who migrated at, a, at an older age. Subjective social status did not impact the probability for those who migrated at a younger age despite them having greater education and income gains than those who migrated at, uh, at younger ages, at, at older ages, sorry. Um, this shows the intergroup heterogeneity and the need to disaggregate ethno-racial groups to identify intergroup disparities. Intersectionality helps to explain intra and intergroup disparities. And these will remain, disparity differences, will remain unclear if we don't take into account factors like intersectionality in our analysis. There are several methods statistically to examine intersectionality. However, they're often not used in analysis. When they are used, the most often is interaction analyses or ethnographic, sorry, ethno-racial group stratification. But interaction analyses require large sample sizes and are often not performed. Several other alternatives exist for how to examine intersectionality. One is to take a life course approach and compare trajectories of psychopathology over time. That is examine whether risk factors accumulate and interact longitudinally in different ways across ethno-racial groups or subgroups to yield distinct mental health outcomes. A life course approach can also identify specific life periods of relative vulnerability or resilience, so-called critical periods, and test whether these coincide or differ across ethno-racial groups or specific subgroups, such as by gender or socioeconomic status. Network analysis 
can compare the evolving interconnections among symptoms over time, examining whether these networks vary across ethno-racial groups or subgroups. Latent class models may identify specific clusters of identity characteristics that are associated with a given mental health outcome. This may simplify the search for relevant aspects of intersectionality. Commonalities and differences can then be identified across intra-ethno-racial subgroups, possibly creating typologies that can be tested in other datasets. Finally, decomposition analyses are counterfactual experiments with the data in which one aspect of intersectionality, such as income, is artifactually altered at a time, one at a time, is altered to observe its effect on other variables, such as mental health outcome. You change one variable and you see how it affects an outcome variable. This process can reveal that certain aspects of identity or social position play a particularly important role in the risk of psychopathology, identifying ways, identifying ways in which ethno-racial subgroups differ or are similar, depending on how the, uh, the changing variable affects the outcome in different groups. These are all ways to examine data in order to clarify the contributions to psychopathology risk from specific interrelationships among intersectional characteristics. A second contribution to the complexity of risk across ethno-racial groups is the person's own interpretation of experience called subjective appraisal. This is central to classic, classic stress theories as appraisal modifies the impact of objectively assessed stressors. Subjective appraisal helps explain why there is so much intra and inter ethno-racial group variability in the association between objective measures of adversity and mental health disparities. The example is in the next slide. This uh, shows that subjective appraisal can have an even greater effect on psychopathology than objectively defined risk factors. For example, this study by Sidra Goldman Meller's group involving an ethno-racially diverse representative sample of adolescents in California, the California Health Interview Survey, examined the relationship of the person's own perception of the safety of their neighborhood compared to an objectively defined measure of neighborhood safety, which is composed of, violent, of the violent crime rate obtained from law enforcement data geocoded to the participant's address. The subjective measure is here and the objective measure of crime rate is here. And the uh, study used the Kessler six scale as a measure of serious psychological distress. The, I, what the graph shows is that adjusting for individual, family, and other neighborhood level covariates, both subjective and objective measures had an effect on the prevalence of serious psychological disorder, but the impact of the perceived safety was greater and statistically significant. This one was not. The effect of perceived safety remains in, unchanged when the analysis was adjusted by objectively measured neighborhood violence, it's when it was included as a covariate, perception still remained equally significant um, as a covariate, even when the objective measure was added as a covariate. A different study, not the one I'm showing you, but just to tell you a different study, found similarly independent effects of perceived neighborhood safety on neurohormonal and inflammatory markers of stress independent of neighborhood income and individual income. So again, using a biological biomarker in this case, they found the same effect in a different study of the importance of subjective appraisal. A third contributor to the complexity of ethno-racial disparities is the way societies are organized and how this differentially affects ethno-racial groups and subgroups with re reference to um, the uh, the various social determinants of health and mental health that have become a very important aspect of disparity research. These are manifestations 
of these social forces and the ways societies are organized. For example, foundational such of social forces, such as laws and policies, built environments such as access to transportation, the safety of buildings, social environments such as social contact. In particular, disparity work has been pointing to the key role of structural racism in patterning these access to resources and social determinants. In particular, the importance, the central importance of racialized residential segregation, which was defined by David Williams, I like this quote, as the physical separation of racialized groups by enforced residents in certain areas, which is an institutional mechanism of racism. Residential segregation patterns the exposures not only to everyday stressors, but also to major adverse events like violence, as well as the exposure, the availability of opportunities. Therefore, social structure helps explain the impact of social position on intra and intergroup disparities by virtue of the relative uh, relationship with these different social determinants of health, depending on the multiple ways that different ethno-racial groups and subgroups interact with these uh, ways that societies are organized. Here's the example for the impact of racialized residential segregation. This is a study by Fuong Do's, Do's group with a nationally representative sample of black and white participants, the National Health Interview Survey. It examined the relationship between geocoded neighborhood level index of residential segregation, in this case, how even the uh, racial distribution is of the geographic area and self-reported K6 data shown in the bars as a measure of serious psychological distress. And the, uh, the investigators stratified the sample by high here and low neighborhood poverty level using census data. What it shows is that after adjusting for individual characteristics, including family income, Residential segregation impacted the probability of serious psychological distress only in high income areas. In the, the, the you, you, we see it in, in, this is all in black, in the black uh, moiety, the black component of this uh, national representative sample. You see the impact of segregation only in the high income areas and not in the low income areas, pointing out again, the variability of effects depending on your position in the social hierarchy. So essentially, this shows the importance of two structural variables, residential segregation and neighborhood poverty, which are often correlated in American cities and many other places as well. In the non-white, sorry, in the white sample, in the non-Latino, non-Latinx white sample, there was no association between residential segregation and psychological distress, either overall or by neighborhood poverty level. Again, another study also found a biological effect over 10 years of neighborhood level socioeconomic status and a, and a biomarker of aging, telomere shortening, that was also independent of individual SES. These uh, findings highlight the need to include structural level data to clarify ethno-racial disparities in psychopathology risk. So I'm gonna wrap up this first part of the talk by discussing very briefly, listing really, some of the future directions for mental health research that NIMH could, and other funders and agencies, could focus on. One is longitudinal multi-level examinations in diverse populations to emphasize on the longitudinal and multi-level that I have been showing are important and diverse populations in terms of intersectionality and every other subgroup possibility there. We need both population level designs and tailored approaches to follow up the population level to get the big picture, but then following up with tailored designs of specific ethno-racial groups to avoid missing ways in which risks of path psychopathology affect specific subgroups that can cause disparities to worsen if left unattended. If you just look at the overall population and assume that if you just treat the overall average of problems, you will quickly discover that uh, some populations are left behind. That the, 
essentially the boats rise, but not all boats, boats rise equally. Some actually sink by virtue of the, the differential risks that are worsened or you know, uh, taken care of, improved by the interventions. It's also important, you notice that most of these studies I showed focused on symptoms. It's important to move beyond symptoms to also examine disorders. We need innovative methods uh, in addition to the ones I already mentioned, such as, for example, an example could be machine learning to derive novel structural targets from large linked databases, such as the US Census and Medicaid data, looking for specific structural related issues that intersect, that are, uh, that are pointed out by that intersection of data. Uh, a final point I wanna make is about intergenerational effects. That's another way I didn't mention much that I didn't mention at all, that disparities manifest. And uh, this is a way in which adversity ex experienced by the parents is transmitted to their offspring, both epigenetically and via, via parenting effects. This is an important contribution. A colleague, Cristiani Duarte and Jonathan Posner and others at uh, Colombia and Puerto Rico are working on this topic. Myrna Weissman, of course, many others. The second area that I wanted to bring up has to do with mental health assessment. I've already given examples about how to measure intersectionality, subjective appraisal, structural factors from the research already presented. Now I wanna focus on how to assess these important variables in clinical research and how to include in mental health care as well. The, this section has two parts, person-centered contextual assessment and communication and implicit bias. Person-centered contextual assessment includes a person's wants, needs, abilities, and circumstances in the process of assessment. It goes beyond just uh, clinical, if you will, symptom level, if you like. It, uh, and it, it's obtained from the perspective of persons and uh, the person and their significant others. That's a usual part of person-centered contextual assessment, often includes the perspectives of others as well. It obtains information on multiple aspects of what I've described so far. You can obtain information on intersectionality, appraisal, and so the impact of societal structure from person-centered assessments. And it complements uh, generic, I'm gonna call them assessments in research and clinical work. Here is what I'm calling a generic assessment, essentially about intersection, you know, uh, tagged to each of the three kinds of uh, major contributors to uh, ethno-racial disparities and the complexity of ethno-racial disparities that I was pointing out earlier. For intersectionality, your generic assessment will ask demographic indicators, symptom experience for essentially as, as, as quick, as close as it typically gets often to symptom experience, and then rather as, uh, you know, generic uh, assessments of living arrangements and food insecurity. These are necessary. I don't want to give you the impression only person-centered is needed. It's just these generic uh, data are uh, a baseline and a, a beginning, but not enough. When person-centered assessment uh, takes uh, the, the place, uh, when you do a person-centered assessment, there are many other things that you can ask about, about the person's own experience, the relevant aspects of identity, the most troubling aspects of a problem, not just the symptoms, their experience of discrimination, and so on. You can read them there. And these are actually literal examples taken from two instruments of person-centered assessment, the cultural formulation interview and the structural vulnerability questionnaire that focuses on structural factors. I will now turn to the cultural formulation interview. It's a social cultural assessment for evaluation and treatment planning. It's one example of a person-centered contextual assessment that was developed for DSM-5 based on the cultural formulation framework that had appeared in DSM-4, which is the cultural formulation framework is a way of organizing and interpreting information, a method on the impact of cultural and social contexts on the experience of mental and emotional distress based on the views and practices of the person and their social network. It was developed, as Josh kindly said, by an international group of developers that my center led, um, and it can be used for initial evaluation and treatment planning with any patient by any provider in any care setting. It has three components. Um, a core CFI, we call it, that is uh, 16 question, questions asked of the person themselves, an informant version, we call it, that asks for collateral information, and 12 supplementary modules 
that can deepen the assessment as needed. And here are the four domains of the cultural formulation interview, the core version. Uh, I won't go through them in detail. First, find out about the person's definition of the problem. The A, B, C are the subunits of the large domains. Each one has several questions. The first one, for example, has three questions like that. But the first domain is what does the, the person and their social network think is happening? The second one is what do they think is causing it? What is, makes it better or worse? What aspects of cultural identity are involved? The third section has to do with what they've done in the past to cope and what got in the way of seeking help or coping. And the fourth section has uh, focuses on current help seeking. What is it they want now and how does it relate to the care they're about to receive? This CFI can be used at the beginning of any initial clinical evaluation or at any point in care where uh, people think it's useful to assess the impact of sociocultural issues. Josh mentioned the field trial. These are the countries and sites where it was uh, held. There was uh, five countries, sorry, uh, six countries <laughs> and 11 sites um, with 318 patients, 75 clinicians and 86 relatives. And it essentially found that the CFI was perceived by all three of those groups, patients, clinicians, and relatives as feasible, acceptable, and useful, and that it enhanced the rapport, communication, and expressions of caring in the patient-clinician relationship. Um, it also, there's also been research on uh, 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 the CFI that shows how it advances the cultural competence of psychiatric trainee. this, trainees. This wasn't part of the field trial, but rather it was, um, uh, has been conducted in different parts of the US and elsewhere internationally over the years since the CFI came out. The, the, uh, another piece of information that the person sent, another aspect of care that the person-centered cultural contextual assessment can be useful for is improving the accuracy and completeness of diagnostic evaluation. This slide refers to research on a different operationalization of the cultural formulation framework. Remember, there was a narrative framework in DSM-4 that has been operationalized by different groups internationally. This is work in Canada at McGill in Montreal by Lawrence Kermeyer and other folks there. Um, in which they run the cultural consultation service, which uses a cultural formulation approach to receive referrals across the city of Montreal from people, patients, whom providers feel there's some conflict or difficulty in their care that has something to do with culture. Most of the people referred were refugees, immigrants, uh, often from uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and many other parts of the world, uh, East Asia and many other parts of the world. Um, what this study found is that they, they followed 323 um, uh, uh, patients who were referred to their service. And what they found is that the group that was referred with a psychotic disorder, remember these are people referred by clinicians to a consultation. So the 70 patients who were referred with a referral diagnosis of psychosis, about half of them had their psychosis diagnosis re-diagnosed using a cultural formulation approach. The opposite only happened in 5%, that is of the 253 who came in without a psychotic diagnosis, only five were re-diagnosed after a cultural formulation and more in-depth assessment as having diagnosed, a diagnosis of psychosis. So you can see that there's number one, an overdiagnosis of psychosis, many of the, much of the time when presentations come in that are unclear. And also um, uh, the importance basically of some of the missed diagnoses that were included in refugees and immigrants, probably PTSD and a few others that were, were unearthed, if you will, by a person-centered contextual assessment. The next point I want to make has to do with the fact of subjective appraisal. Earlier, I said that subjective appraisal can have a major impact on ethno-racial disparities in mental health outcomes. Here, I focus on the fact that subjective appraisal is not just idiosyncratic to the individual, but emerges from cultural traditions of what symptoms mean, how they are experienced, and how they are reported to clinicians, researchers, family, etc. These traditions are transmitted by ethno-racial groups and subgroups, including, you know, from generation to generation, including with great intragroup variation and change over time. This list here on the right illustrates 
uh, the uh, uh, folk nosology, if you will, of uh, cultural concepts of distress, idioms or expressions of distress, cultural syndromes in the Latinx Caribbean. And uh, in, in some of these are held very widely by many people in the community. Others are specific to subgroups. Now, on the left, you see DSM-5 diagnosis. These are here to show you that the relationship between, as soon as I get my animation to work, oh, huh, there, the relationship between, um, I think there's one before, yes, the relationship between the psychiatric diagnosis and the folk diagnosis or, or idioms, if you will, are not never one-to-one. -one. They're always one-to-many. They're always complex. What makes a category like major depression hang together is not what makes these cultural concepts, uh, it's not exactly the same as what makes these cultural concepts hang together. And the same is true vice versa. Um, what makes the category in the Latinx cultural group uh, groups hang together is considered heterogeneous from the professional nosology. This variety affects not only clinical care, but anything that depends on asking people about their symptoms of experience, including most mental health research. It means that in mental health assessment, we cannot assume a universalism in the relationship between symptom reports and disorders. We must consider the complexity of their relationship in a process of translation, as if we were talking as we are often different languages. Now, I'm going to turn to uh, factors that impair the process of communication, including clinician bias, which can affect many clinicians seeing BIPOC patients. Implicit biases are unconscious, automatic mental associations between a social group, stereotypes, and forms of prejudice. Anti-Black implicit bias is particularly prominent in the US due to structural racism. Poor communication and implicit bias affect the rapport and exchange of information in clinical care and research, including the quality of the data obtained on intersectionality, appraisal, and structural factors. Importantly, interference in communication is associated with lower quality of care and patient disengagement. However, community, uh, sorry, communication processes may respond to intervention. Research on implicit bias is ongoing, but so far, on whether it's amenable to intervention, but so far, brief interventions do not appear very effective. Longer interventions may be more effective, but require institutional buy-in. So now I'm going to round out this section by talking about future research directions. We should continue to study the impact of assessment on information exchange and processes of care. These are different ways, for example, the studying the association between implicit bias, observed clinician behavior, and patient outcomes. Many, many, much of the research doesn't do the observed clinician behavior and connect it to patient outcomes as, in, as a function of implicit bias. We also need to look at the impact of sociocultural assessment of all kinds on longitudinal patient outcomes. We need to find the best implementation strategies in routine care. For example, in terms of assessment during a clinical assessment or other kinds, one could program an electronic health record to automatically present community level data that is geocoded to the patient's address and is relevant to the symptoms or diagnosis entered by the clinician. For example, if you're entering information on PTSD, the EHR and the EHR has your ad, the address of the person may bring up the crime rates of that area or other possible uh, elements that could worsen or precipitate uh, a PTSD-like situation. We also need study on longitudinal effects of clinician training, especially with respect to implicit bias reduction and how it can be used in routine clinical and research settings. And then the fifth bullet about testing alternative approaches for improving clinician behavior. Many interesting ideas here about using value-based care, not just trying, just don't only try to change their behavior, change how they're paid by virtue of the, of the way the outcomes happen or address the biases that structure the work environment. For example, change, uh, improve the uh, ethno-racial representation of in the leadership or the equity in pay, and then see what downstream effects this has on implicit bias. The third and final section of my presentation has to do with strategies to 
eliminate ethno-racial disparities in service access and delivery. There are five uh, subtopics. I will cover these five strategies. Engaging with communities. I won't read them now because each one will actually be, we, uh, you will see them each one at a time. But for each strategy, I will present the primary target or targeted addresses among the ones I've mentioned, intersectionality and so on, what approach it followed, and then give an example uh, illustrating the strategy. And for each example, I try to say the problem it's addressing and then how it's going about it and if there are any results so far, what it has achieved. The first strategy has to do with engaging with communities. And it, it can be useful for any of the targets that we have discussed so far. It involves organizing how researchers or clinicians engage with communities to implement a given intervention in a real world setting. And these can be pitched, these interventions, at any level, individual, interpersonal, et cetera, organizational, even societal and policy levels. This approach ensures engagement with community partners is authentic, not superficial. And according to the Cochrane 20, Cochran 2015 review on these kinds of interventions and strategies, it consists of three main approaches listed here. To be aware of multiple forces at all levels, such as the ones I've been describing, to invest in community participation in the process of care or research and to prioritize community defined mental health and social outcomes, or at least community mental health and social outcomes, if not defined by themselves. Um, there are seven main areas that a, a, a recent literature review uh, uh, yielded were typically used in this, uh, in this, with this type of approach, collaborative care and multi-sector, early psychosis, school, you can read them there. There are various kinds of uh, community sectors where this kind of community approach is being used. There are others. These are just some of the main, the, the most, most used ones. Here's an example of this kind of uh, strategy or intervention. It's called Community Partners in Care. Ken Wells, Laura Jones, Felicia Jones, and so on in the LA area. The problem they're trying to address is limited access to major depression care in low income communities. They're working in LA. And their approach consists of coalition building of multi-sectoral community-based organizations to engage stakeholders in a collaborative care model that includes providing uh, depression services in primary care. There are many sectors that, in addition to primary care, including substance, homeless services, uh, and other community programs such as faith-based and so on. The coalition, importantly, is co-led, implemented, and monitored the services. It's actually the, what is leading, implementing, and monitoring is the coalition, not the researchers alone. Um, and the, what, what this particular study they've been following for a number of years now was a, a randomized control trial that compared regular implementation of a toolkit and technical assistance with and without this coalition type building process. They had a lot of programs and people in two communities in LA. At six months, they found improved clinically and community defined outcomes. But I wanted to prioritize here the follow-up at five years, at four years, which is unusual to have a intervention that is able to be followed this long. It's fantastic, um, at least in mental health, it's fantastic. And you see here some of the clinically defined and community defined type of remissions and outcomes that they study. Community defined remission had to do with a wellness indicators, not just symptom indicators. And essentially what this shows, these numbers show the ORs and the, they reduce the bad things and increase the good things. Um, the idea being that this coalition building approach um, is more useful than simple program implementation, which is what typically happens even in the best of circumstances. So it's good to do this community type of work. A second intervention strategy, if you will, has to do with tailoring interventions for particular subgroups. It typically, this kind of intervention is a subtype of a community-based implementation strategy as covered in the previous slides. And what makes this one unique is that the primary target is precisely the intersectionality of the community participants. And the approach you see is to tailor the services for a specific community subgroup, typically organized around aspects or identity of identity, 
or socio-structural position, like being in a faith-based community or a school or criminal justice system and so on. And what it does is leverage the subgroup commonalities to address disparities. For example, uh, the work of Sidney Hankerson here in, in New York on church-based mental health services, the problem that his group is trying to address is that uh, Black Americans in New York with major depression were less likely, 30 to 50 percent as likely as whites, to receive treatment for their depression. And that he was basically basing uh, that there's so many barriers to care in this community, including lack of access and so on. And so what, what uh, the group is doing is uh, using screening and referral se uh, services in a trusted setting, community setting, such as church, as faith-based community, and partnering with the church-based uh, group in order to um, uh, uh, use this uh, to uh, bring out depression services to the community, particularly given the importance of the Black church and the Black community. Um, the approach, uh, the specific thing they've done is to screen in a number of New York City churches. It was the, that's a number of people who, uh, who, uh, who participated. And they found a very high rate of probable MDD using the PHQ, but none of the participants, zero, accepted mental health treatment referral, indicating a, an access and, and trust and so on problem in the sense that the, the services were not trusted or there was a lot of stigma, or there were other interpretations, uh, for example, appraisal with respect to what should be done with these problems. So what a currently an IMH funded R01 is doing is testing uh, how to, uh, in different groups of churches, how to uh, have community health workers who are church-based act as interventionists to conduct SBIRT, um, uh, the screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment modality uh, to see if that allows for better enrollment and participation and quality of life and reduction in symptoms in this community compared to a slightly enhanced usual care with psychoeducation and lists of referrals and so on. And there's also a process evaluation going on. So this is great that NIMH has funded this project. Uh, it should fund more projects like this. <laughs> um, a third strategy has to do with leveraging technology to reduce disparities. And the primary target are structural barriers to accessing care and appraisal, for example, stigmas I mentioned before, by facilitating remote access and engagement in services and self help using technological modalities. You can see several of them here, either remote delivery of traditional services or technology mediated self help or technological adjuncts like the one that I'm going to describe in a minute in which uh, intervention reminders were sent uh, and moods, mood scales were obtained. The, these interventions have been found to be clinically effective. They can reduce uh, the barriers that we were discussing. There is the issue of the digital divide, which people bring up and it's something definitely to consider. At the same time, sometimes uh, it's, it, the digital divide is presented too simply because it's a complex issue. Um, for example, US Latinx communities are similar to whites in their use of smartphones. It's just that there are certain financial barriers that are more high in the Latinx community having to do with um, not having home broadband or data caps and so on. So the modality to be used depends on the type of uh, intervention, that the, the type of community that is being accessed and other factors such as age. So here, this study that I am uh, discussing, presenting to you as an example, is one in which text messaging was used to increase engagement. And the problem that it's addressing is the poor BIPOC engagement in CBT treatment, inhibiting effectiveness. And the solution attempted, technological solution, was to automate text messages to increase engagement in CD, CBT effects in Latinx with MDD. Um, an RCT was done of, a, of during 16 group CBT of people participating Latinx who are depressed with or without text messaging. And you see from these numbers that the mean time in CBT treatment increased fairly dramatically from three weeks to almost 14 weeks out of the 16 uh, with the use of these text messages. And another important element was that the daily self-rated moods were sent out to patients. They responded via text. And these mood scores, simple mood scores, correlated significantly with PHQ-9 measures 
and significantly predicted the next day CBT session attendance, the self-reported simple mood score, which means that this can is very helpful for scaling up because you can automate uh, either text reminders to people who are particularly depressed, or you can automate uh, reminders about CBT to people who are, you know, whose, uh, whose mood is worse and so on. Very useful. The uh, next intervention that I will target, and I realize time is running out or has run out, I will um, more briefly say these, have to do with improving patient communication, patient provider communication. Um, and this can take the place of uh, addressing both communication content and context. You can see content being exchange of ideas and context being the interpersonal situational influences affecting this exchange, including, for example, uh, here are examples from a systematic lead review that my colleague Neil Agarwal in our center did. These are a couple examples, there are others, but of content concern, patient concerns about uh, useful or unuseful or, or inappropriate uh, uh, tr treatment for mental, mental health not being useful or appropriate or stigma or discordant community styles and the way people expect to be treated by their clinicians, where, wh whether exploratory or uh, telling people what to do. So there are all these concerns about communication and different strategies for how to improve communication. One of them that's particularly interesting is addressing the poor participatory nature of BIPOC mental health treatment that leads to poor care and outcomes, meaning BIPOC care is often not as participatory as care of other communities. And what uh, this group led by Maggie Allegri and others is, is doing is trying to enhance patient activation and clinician and patient shared decision-making through these coaching techniques designed for both patients and clinicians. And what they found in uh, uh, their most recent study is that if you have any patient coaching you improve of, of uh, the clinician, on blinded shared decision-making assessments, you have a Cohen's D that's almost 0.3. And if you have maximal coaching, it approaches 0.8. And the this is from blind encoded of the, of the interactions, blinded coding. But if you do maximal co coaching for both patients and clinicians, you can increase patient quality of care by a lot, at least according to patients' perceptions. The final intervention has to do with intervening, the type of intervention, intervening on social inequities. And these addresses social, uh, sorry, social structural factors by, for example, connecting the person directly to resources, thinking outside the box, outside of the clinical box, if you will, of what is usually considered clinical by removing barriers or training people how to access these different uh, types of resources. They partner with stakeholders to identify the best targets it's important to assess mechanisms and process factors so that when it gets used in the real world, we don't get confused by the messiness of the many process, many factors that are involved. So we keep track of what processes and mechanisms are most important. And it's important to include longitudinal evaluation sustainability because often this kind of intervention takes a long time and part of the has to be built into the intervention is how to make it last. An example of this is work that my colleague, uh, Oscar Jimena Solomon is conducting where he tackles, he and his group tackle the, the, the problem of high objective financial hardship in BIPOC communities. And the fact that high objective financial hardship is, is, you know, is essentially higher debt and an inability to meet uh, basic needs and so on. How this is affected, uh, how this is connected to suicide related outcomes. Uh, Interestingly, there is elevated suicidal ideation and attempts awfully, but interestingly, there's, it's not suicide death that is elevated in some BIPOC groups, many, but rather it's suicidal ideation and attempts is elevated relative to whites in some BIPOC groups, which also speaks about resilience to actual death by suicide, but a certain risk to suicidal ideation and attempts. And so the intervention, what it does is uh, empower people to access these resources you, through this mechanisms, these mechanisms of peer-led interventions and so on to uh, tackle objective uh, hardship by improving wellness, both objectively and subjectively here, hope and shame are very important in order to reduce suicidal ideation and behavior. This has been funded by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, but it's just starting. So we don't have outcome data yet, but it's very exciting. So future directions for this last section, then I'll turn to conclusions. These are uh, aspects of research that could be emphasized going forward. 
we need more research on implementation strategies to reconcile community and academic views of primary targets for intervention, how to, how to bring those two together. Up, uh, identify the best partnership structures for multi-sector collaboration, address the risks of diverse, the, the, sorry, the, address the risks, the diverse risks, <laughs> there's a typo there, uh, within population-wide interventions, what I was mentioning before, you need both the population-wide and you need the, the specific risks for subgroups to assemble parsimonious but multi-level intervention package is hard to do in the real world, but very important, and to balance scalability and effectiveness when first designing an intervention. It's wonderful to have a very complicated intervention that works, but how do you get it out into the world? So in conclusion, in this talk, I intended to show you that causes and pathways of ethno-racial disparities are complex and are affected by these multiple factors I mentioned. We need research designs in partnership with communities that are longitudinal, multi-level and multi-sectoral that target community plus individual and objective plus subjective factors that tailor interventions and implementation strategies to specific contexts and that assess mechanisms and processes to guide replicability and sustainability. We also need to implement what is known we know a lot already. We need to implement what is known, fill the knowledge gaps, and iteratively reassess to test causes and pathways of disparities and ways to eliminate them. This points to the importance of leadership and institutional will to achieve this. So I'm very glad to be speaking to you about this. I want to thank everybody who contributed to the task. These are some of the members of the Cultural, Com Com uh, Cultural Competence Center on the top right, and that's our website below. Thank you also for your attention. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Roberto, for an excellent talk. Um, we have many questions, so I will do my best to combine and parse them as much as possible. Um, and if you're available uh, to go over by sure. a couple minutes, we can do that and, and then I'll hand it back over to uh, Dr. Gordon at the end. Um, do you think it's accurate to assume that misdiagnosis of certain mental health disorders is higher um, in the BIPOC community? And similarly, have you seen if there are certain mental health disorders that are more likely to be diagnosed uh, among individuals facing more social conflict? Facing more social conflict. Correct, who've uh -huh. experienced more social conflict. There is a lot of evidence of misdiagnosis in BIPOC communities, for sure. There are certain disorders that are, certain presentations, if you will, that are particularly prone to misdiagnosis. Uh, presentations in uh, particularly African Americans, black uh, individuals who show who appear with mood disorders with psychotic features or possibly psychotic features are routinely misdiagnosed as having schizophrenia. This has been shown now for a few decades now. There's also misdiagnosis of conduct disorder and of oppositional defined disorder in uh, um, BIPOC youth, particularly again, black individuals. And there's also delays, substantial delays in diagnosis, for example, ADHD uh, in certain communities. So there, forgive me, <laughs> I have to turn off the, uh, the phone. Um, so these are, these are just some of the examples. Misdiagnosis is very prevalent. And one, one big element that has been found, work of Steven Strakowski and others, is uh, the difference in the amount of information that is gathered, essentially, um, not enough, uh, some it, that comes to the topic of assessment, not enough information is gathered in some communities by virtue either of disparate care or the disparate services they, they, they are, uh, have access to. So this is one of the main reasons of misdiagnosis. The other one is you're saying, does it happen more in situations of social conflict? Is that, that was right? Yeah, I, I believe the question is also, are there are specific disorders expected to be seen more? Um, and those who've experienced social conflict. Ah, I see, I see. I think that varies. I don't have uh, uh, an answer right at the tip of my tongue about exactly which, uh, there are some that are, depends on the, ex it depends, uh, depends on the extent of trauma, depends also on the um, extent of access to certain um, uh, things like uh, uh, substances in the community that, that, that actually can trigger that kind of uh, response so that in areas of social conflict or social stress, 
Some people have more access or there are more liquor stores, for example, <laughs> in certain low income communities so that you have a, a greater risk of substance disorders there and so on. There are, there are many socially structured uh, Consequ uh, reasons why certain disorders happen more than others than in other communities. There are also, as I mentioned, preferred ways of expressing distress in the sense of culturally patterned expressions that could point people in one direction or another um, in terms of what is expressed, whether anxiety is more prevalent, depression, what type of depression, somatic symptoms, and so on. So all of these are at play at the same time. So I think we have time for one more oh, question. Um, <laughs> you said that we need to implement what is known. What would be your top three strategies uh, to implement at a typical mental health program? And there have also been a couple of questions about how syndemic theory might play might play into this. So I don't know if that if that might be able to be integrated um, as well. But that's actually come up in quite quite a number of the questions. I think syndemic theory could easily have been a big part of this uh, presentation. Um, it's the idea that uh, that uh, Meryl, Sing Meryl Singer and others have been working on this for some time. The, the idea that epidemics, social health epidemics happen in synchrony. They don't happen isolatedly. It isn't like it, people have multiple problems all at the same time by virtue of these social causations, essentially. And so that leads to an answer of, I don't know about top three exactly, but the, the idea that you want multi, the word multi has appeared a lot in the talk, multi-level, multi-sectoral, in some ways multi-disorder, distress-focused, community definition of distress-focused interventions. And then which three, if you will, or which 10, depend on the strategies, and this is what I've tried to show, depends on the strategies that you wanna implement in the problem that is in facing the community you're, you're, you're working with and including stakeholders in it in order to determine the best approaches. So for example, that first one I mentioned, I mentioned it first, the community, authentic community partnerships, because those are extremely important to almost anything you do. You, you want to involve the stakeholders in the, uh, in the, in the uh, not only the definition of the problem, but the, the structure of the solution, so you can uh, find together the best uh, uh, answers to the problems that you jointly identify. Thank you. Um, so I'll turn this back over to, uh, to Dr. Gordon um, before he comes back on. I do want to wish it, uh, to thank our interpreting team um, who stayed on a little late. Um, they've done a real fantastic job today. So thank you to them. Hi, uh, and uh, thank you, Roberto, for uh, visiting with us today and for this excellent talk. Thank you very much to the audience. We have lots and lots of questions. Would it be okay if we uh, accumulate them and send them an email and we can distribute them later to folks if you have any that you particularly like to, like to answer? Yeah, sure. Please. I'm also, I, I know people have time constraints. I'm, I'm able to stay a few more minutes if you're able to. I think, I think unfortunately, we do have to close because yeah. of the interpreter okay. issues. But thank you very, very much. And uh, looking forward to our next, uh, uh, our continuation of this series in the fall. Thanks, Hall. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me.